Okay, I want to welcome everybody here today. Uh, my name is Kim Wetzel Williams. I'm a Wyandotte County Master Gardener from the class of 2003. I have been vegetable gardening in one way or another since 1983. Uh, before that, my mother tried to interest me in gardening and I said, no way, it's hot outside, it's dirty, yucky, and there are bugs. But then something gave me the gardening bug and I really got into it. Anyway, today's class is maximizing space in your small food garden. And I want to give credit to Rebecca McMahon, who is the horticulture agent with Sedgwick County Extension, that's Wichita. Uh, most of these slides came from a presentation she made a number of years ago at a K-State uh, Research and Extension Conference. Uh, I, of course, adapted some things and made it my own. So we're going to talk about maximizing space in your small food garden. And we're going to look at it from two angles. One, maximizing by space. And then two, maximizing by time. So the first thing you have to do is make a plan. Plan for why you're gardening. Plan for time, when. Plan for space, where. Plan for space, how. And plan for the merging of time and space. Sounds complicated. It's not. Okay, so what is your priority? Why are you gardening? For me, I wanted fresh vegetables. With my first garden, I had two wash tubs. I poked holes in, set them on my deck on my uh, apartment. And I planted a tomato in one and a cucumber in the other. The next year I added some lettuce and spinach. Then I got married, we bought a house, we had a kid. Reasons for gardening changed. I wanted fresh vegetables to eat, and I also wanted to grow plenty enough so that I could can and otherwise per, uh, preserve the produce for eating through the rest of the year. Other people garden to save money. Some grow produce that you can't find in our local groceries or you can't afford in our local groceries. For instance, I went into a real grocery store the other day. I tend to shop at the big box places. And I went into a real grocery store the other day and was horrified to see that leaf lettuce was selling for $7 a head. I was grateful that I have a pot of leaf lettuce going right now on my deck. Um, some garden just for the enjoyment of being out there with the plants and their exercise and some like to involve children. So whatever your reason for gardening is, keep that uppermost in your mind. Next thing you want to do is you want to measure the area that you're gardening in. Whether you're gardening flat on the ground or you're gardening in raised beds or you're gardening in containers, you need to know how much space you have. And everybody says, oh, I don't know why I needed that math from high school. I'm never going to use it. Well, when I started gardening, the first thing I had to do was go to the library and check out a geometry book so I could remember how to calculate area. I've made it simple here for you. On the screen, you can see that area is length times width. Unless you're dealing with a circle, then it's pi r square. Now you have to figure out what do you want to grow? Three lists for you. The things you absolutely must have. Maybe it's not these things listed in this column. Again, make it personal for yourself. Then a second column, a second priority, my, uh, I would say, is what would you like if you have room left over after you have your must-haves? And then thirdly, what would be fun to try that maybe I've never grown before? Then decide upon your varieties. The seed catalogs are starting, will be coming out here really soon. They used to come after Christmas. I've noticed anymore they start coming in November and they seem to come out earlier and earlier. If for some reason you don't get any of those catalogs and you would like to get some seed catalogs, just go online and do a search for seed catalogs, plant catalogs, and a whole slew will pop up. So then go through those, decide on, I want tomatoes. Okay, well, what kind of tomatoes do you want? Do you want hybrids? Do you want heirlooms? Each has its advantages and disadvantages. Look at not just the pictures, but also read the descriptions of those items in the catalog. 
because there are some very important things that you will find and we'll get to that in a moment. Okay, so we've planned. We've measured our garden space, we've prioritized our vegetables and we've listed the varieties we want. Oh, I should add, if you have questions, hold them at the end. I'll take them all up then if I haven't answered them somewhere along the line in the presentation. Three major considerations for planning in time. You want to think about, okay, when am I gonna plant these? Am I going to plant seeds directly outside? Am I going to start seeds inside and grow these little plants under lights until it's time to transplant them? So that's your first consideration. When am I planting? Then you want to consider your harvest time. And again, this is information that you're going to find in the catalogs and on the seed packets. So for instance, this cauliflower says to start it in a well-lighted area indoors about eight weeks before planting outside, and it will develop 65 to 75 days after transplanting. So there, the packet has given you your planting date and your harvest time. Then if you're really ambitious, you can look at, gee, can I garden in the fall? Could I maybe do something in the winter? If that interests you, then read your information in line with that priority. The reason is, is because we have cool season vegetables and we have warm season vegetables. Obviously, as the names imply, cool season isn't going to do well in the summer and warm season is not going to do well in the spring or the fall. How do you know what's what? The USDA has a plant hardiness zone map and I tried to find the most recent one I could because they keep changing every year. This one actually was based on the extreme minimum temperature for the 25 years from 1976 to 2005. And that was when many of us saw our locale being shifted into a warmer zone. So what plant hardiness map shows is what is the minimum temperature and it's an average that these plants will survive. So in Kansas City, we are now in zone 6A. That's that green stripe through the center of the screen. The one thing I found of interest, and I learned this probably 20, 30 years ago through online gardening friends across the country, is that Boston, Massachusetts, which gets these horribly cold and snowy winters, is actually the same USDA hardiness zone as Kansas City. Juneau, Alaska, amazingly, has warmer growing zones than Kansas City. <laughs> so growing zones has nothing to do with when you plant, it has to do with what you plant. When you plant is determined by the number of growing days. And we are blessed here in Kansas with an extremely long growing season. So we may be the same USD hardiness zone as Boston, but we have a much longer growing season. And Kansas actually has three distinct areas for growing. This map I'm currently showing you is in the Kansas Garden Guide, which contains just everything you ever need to know. But as you can see, Wyandotte County, where we are, is located clear up in that corner and we are still in the middle zone, which roughly goes from our last average frost of April 17th to our first average frost of October 14th. And of course, as we've known, seeing the weather patterns changing the last few years, these are averages. You kind of have to learn to pay attention to the weather too. Uh, if you have friends who garden in, let's say, Lawrence or Topeka or Overland Park, they're in a different season than we are. They actually have a longer growing season by a few days. So don't confuse the hardiness map and the growing season map. Both of them are vital information, but they do not tell us the same information. So what's all that mean? We can garden within the parameters set by the last and first arbitrage frost, and we can grow plants that are hardy in USDA zone 6A. And I left the A off that slide. 
Okay, so what this means is we have three growing seasons. We have two seasons for cool crops and one season for warm weather crops. Our cool season runs roughly from mid-March into May, and then again from the end of August to early September into October or November. This year might have been the exception for the fall gardening because it was still hotter than all get out at the end of August. I set my cauliflower, broccoli, and cabbage out on Labor Day weekend and it barely survived the heat. And then we turned around and we had those two nights of freeze and my poor fall garden looks really sad and pathetic, but it's struggling, but it might make it. Okay, so what are cool season crops? What are warm season crops? Very simply, your brassicas, and these are in the order in which you would plant them. Your brassicas, your cabbage, your broccoli, your cauliflower, um, are probably the first things you can put in. Cauliflower is not quite as hardy as broccoli, which is not quite as hardy as cabbage, but literally you're going to go from like March 17th, March 24th, March 31st for those three varieties. Uh, potatoes are going to be planted in there too. Uh, I lied, these aren't in the order of planting. Uh, peas can be planted very early. In fact, one popular method of planting peas is to go out there in the winter if there's snow on the ground and throw your peas on top of the snow where you want them to grow and they'll take care of growing themselves. I've never actually tried that, but we have had some master gardeners who'd have and have reported great success. Okay, so your cool season crops, you can grow in that spring season and you can turn around again in the fall season. Your warm season crops, summer. They like it hot. They don't necessarily like it 100 and some degrees, but they do like it warmer than you're going to get in those early months and the later months. Now, I know we all like to garden by the calendar. Oh, it's March 1st, got to plant my peas. Oh, it's St. Patrick's Day, have to plant my potatoes. But what is more important is your soil temperature. If there's snow on the ground and the ground is still frozen on St. Patrick's Day, you're not going to be planting potatoes. What you need to look at is the soil temperature and they sell thermometers for measuring the soil temperature. So cool season crops, that soil has got to be about 45 degrees. Warm season, 55 and very warm, 60. Very warm would be things like okra, sweet potatoes. Um, and you want to measure at a two to three inch soil depth in the late morning. There is a chart available from Cornell telling when various things need to be planted by the soil temperature. And it's a very long list, very informative. That link is there on the screen. Now, you'll also find some people online or maybe your neighbor or whomever. Oh, I'm gonna plant my tomatoes in April because I want tomatoes in June. I gave up trying to explain to a number of them why that was a waste of time and energy. Uh, it's a fine experiment all you want. I actually did plant tomatoes one year in April. I had to preheat the soil by covering it with black plastic to absorb the sunlight. Then I had to use walls of water to keep that area warm. Then I rigged up a support system and had to put plastic around it to plant my tomatoes in that space. Sun comes up in the morning, starts heating everything up. I had to go out, take the plastic off. Sun goes down at night, it got cool. I had to go put the plastic back on. Maybe you have the energy for that, but I don't. I'll stick to traditional planting. Okay, to make matters even more confusing, think about your days to maturity. And again, this is going to come from your seed packet. The days to maturity is from the time that seed or that transplant goes into the ground. So if you're transplanting tomatoes, you don't count days to maturity by the date you started the seed inside. If you're maximizing your space, you want to plant things that have the shorter time to maturity so that you can free up that ground for planting something else. So be sure and look at that information in seed catalogs before you buy your seeds. Again, like I said, all of this information 
is in the seed catalog. I have no idea about these tomatoes. This is one of those screens I slides I borrowed from Rebecca. But you will find that they will give you the days to maturity. They'll give you disease resistance. And some of them will even say, this is a compact plant that works well in cool climates or in a container or for double seasoning, to use that word. So always, always, always read those labels. You'll also, with tomatoes and a few other plants, run into the terms determinate, semi-determinate, and indeterminate. Indeterminate plants just keep growing and growing and growing and producing fruit until it freezes and they, they're killed. A, indie, a determinate plant grows to a certain height, puts on a full flush of fruit, and then it's done. Semi-determinate falls somewhere in between those two. Um, if you're planting for maximizing your space, plant the determinate varieties. So if you plant a short season tomato that comes to maturity in 60 days and it's determinate and you have your full flush of fruit, you get that, take that tomato out and plant another one. You have now extended your production in the same space, which is maximizing your space. Okay, you can buy your plants at the nursery, as many do. You're going to be limited by the varieties. Um, as many of you know, I didn't get home from traveling until the middle of June. I had no starts of my own. I went to a box store and rescued whatever they had left. They were the usual varieties that get sold all over Kansas City. And that's not bad if you like those, but if you're looking for some variety or you're looking for shorter term or compact plants, you may very well have to start your own seeds. And despite all of this information about harvest dates and planting times and all of that, it's really not rocket science. It becomes very simple after you set your schedule and you start doing it. You can also make it easy on yourself by buying a garden planner. Mine says Cook's Garden, which was an old nursery company that has since gone out of business, but they're available a lot of places. One side of it shows you where to start things in the spring and the flip side shows for fall planting. You pull the little slide thing out, line it up, line the red line up with your first frost date or your last average frost date, and it does the calculations for you. Okay, so you figured out what you're growing, you figured out the time to harvest. Now you're gonna figure out when you need to plant or transplant, record that information so you don't have to do those calculations every year. I mean, roughly we know that we're gonna start tomatoes in, from the end of February into the middle of March for transplant the middle of May or later May, and you're gonna start getting tomatoes weather cooperating in uh, July, September, I mean, July, August. Now I used to do it all by paper like this before there were computers and I thought I'm tired of writing this stuff every year. So I created my own system and those of you here in the room get to see it. It's an old Tupperware box where I made index cards I calculated our first average or last average frost and I did the cards so seven weeks before our last, our first average, I get so confused on this, last average frost first planting. Uh, seven weeks before is February 27th. I line up all my seeds in here by when I need to plant or when I need to transplant. And it gets to be very messy. And so every winter I have to reline everything up. <laughs> So that was one way I overcame having to put things on paper, constantly erase and change and tear the paper. Uh, now, all of we have computers, we have phones, and every, almost everything comes with a built-in to-do list. I entered all those into my phone to-do list, and it pops up. Today is January 31st. Start the seeds for whatever. Much, much easier. But whatever you, whatever you decide to do, Make it easy on yourself so that you don't have to recalculate every year. Okay, if you really want to pack in four season gardening, you can do winter gardening, or as I call it, fooling mother nature. 
Uh, some of our master gardeners have done this. I have successfully grown broccoli, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, and spinach through the winter. It takes hoops, it takes plastic, it may also take winter blankets, and it takes a determination to go out there in the snow if it snows. But it's kind of fun to harvest your own spinach in January and February. Um, I know some of our master gardeners have actually built a greenhouse and they, they grow in their greenhouse. Uh, Pendleton's Country Market, they have the big high tunnels. That's how they keep us in tomatoes through the winter. If you're really interested in winter gardening, get Elliot Coleman's Four Season Harvest. And for those of you in the room, I've got the book over there if you want to take a look at it. He gardens through the winter in Maine. Okay, so we've determined when. We've figured out which vegetables we're going to grow during the spring, summer, fall, and maybe even the winter. We've determined our harvest date. We've determined when we sow seeds and transplant uh, based upon our harvest for each season we are growing. Let's move on now to space. Where are we planting? If you have a very small space, maybe you're just gardening on your deck or your patio in containers. You want to plant things that are very productive. You also want to plant the most expensive things on your list. You don't want to run out and buy something expensive just because you want to grow it because the, 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 the slide says do this. It's what is most expensive on your list of priorities. What's small space? Well, none of these terms actually have a set definition. You just kind of have to look around and decide, do I have a little bit of space? Do I have medium space? Do I have large space? I define my backyard as medium. So if you're gardening in a medium space, plant the productive things, but also plant the things you love. And then if you have a large space, you know, like your, your home sits on an acre or two, You've got all that room to spread out and plant anything you want, but again, prioritize what is most important for you because we as humans have a knack for filling in whatever space we have. It's kind of like spending money. You spend whatever you make, whether it's a little or a lot. Okay, so some definitions. What are productive plants? Well, I looked it up online. And there were a couple of seed catalogs that actually had a web page that said, these are the most productive plants you can grow. And I, so several of them listed all the things that are in that left-hand column. A couple others added the things that are in the right-hand column. And the only caution I can give you on that is remember your priorities. Again, don't plant it just because it's productive. If you don't like kale, I don't like kale. I'm not going to grow kale. If you don't like arugula or mustard greens because they tend to be bitter, don't grow them. Grow what you like that's productive. This is the fun one. What are expensive plants? Well, right off the top of your head, you're gonna go, oh, I don't wanna buy that packet of seeds because there's only 30 seeds in there and it's seven and a half dollars for the packet. That's definitely one consideration. I don't wanna buy that $12 and 50 cent uh, little tiny two inch pot plant that's too expensive. So of course the cost of the seeds and the plants comes into play. But then you also need to look at what is it going to cost to maintain my garden. Uh, I think many of us had skyrocketing water bills this year because of the drought being so severe we spent a lot on water. Most vegetables are going to need water. I don't know of too many that are drought tolerant so everything's going to need water. Everything's going to need being fed. There you've got a little more control over what you're feeding your plants. You can buy high-end expensive fertilizer or you can make your own compost and feed that to your plants. The value of your time is certainly very important. Um, if you work 40 hours a week, you're going to want to plant something that doesn't require you to have massive 
amounts of your time involved in growing and tending to it. Only you know the value of your time. And then of course, there's the cost of buying certain fruits and vegetables. Uh, some of us have a lot of trouble growing zucchini because of squash bugs. Well, in the summer, zucchini is not expensive. I choose to buy my zucchini at the store instead of growing my own. Uh, what those are, again, is personal preference. Then there's the nutritional value of growing your own vegetables versus buying them in the store. Uh, most people think, oh, I'm gonna go buy fresh vegetables. They're really high in nutrients. Actually, I read one time that the produce that is highest in nutrients is the, are the frozen vegetables because when they pick them fresh and they put them on a truck and they send them to the grocery store, the produce starts losing nutrients from the moment it's picked. So if you are interested in high nutrition, then you may want to very well grow your own and preserve your own for use during the winter. One caution, we tend to think that, oh, I'm not gonna buy that seven and a half dollar pack of 30 seeds. Some people will say, oh, I am going to buy that because that price, it must be really good. I think we're all old enough and have lived long enough to know that price and value and quality are not always related. Sometimes a less expensive thing is better than a more expensive thing. Okay, so we've defined our space as small, medium, or large, and we've defined our parameters by productivity and expense. Now let's get into the real meat of this presentation. How are you going to garden? There are lots of layouts. I'm not going to read them to you. You can read them your space, yourself, plus we're gonna be going over them. Uh, so those types of layouts to consider. You have to think about how you're spacing your plants and you want to use your space efficiently. This is the way my grandma gardened. If you've got an acre or two acres, go for it. Each one of those green stripes is a row. You're going to put one plant or one seed down the row next to each other, spacing it however the seed packet says. The circles are, small, are there just to define maybe larger plants than will be held widthwise in one of those rows. Wide row bed system. My mom started doing this one when they started talking Oh, I'd say late 60s into the 70s about maximizing productivity in space. Uh, it's a wide row bed system. So the green stripes with the yellow lines in them are wider than the plain green stripes. And instead of planting one row of vegetables down a green stripe, you're going to plant three or four rows in the wider bed. Now the considerations is if you do a wide row with several lines of plants in it, be sure that you can reach into that from either side of the row. You don't wanna walk on these things. It compacts the soil, makes it hard for the roots to work and pick up the nutrients. The wide row system morphed into a grid system. And again, still, this is flat on the ground. And, but it's thinking in terms of maybe raising the soil a little, and I'm going to give a tomato two by two feet and a zucchini two by two feet, and I'm gonna grow some of this up the trellis. And then finally, this grid system morphed into your weight raised bed system, where you do what Mel Bartholomew called square foot gardening. So in this four by four foot bed, there is a lot of stuff packed in there. The red oct octagons are probably tomatoes. Tomatoes tend to need two by two feet. Um, then in front of those, we've got things taking up one by one foot. And as you can see, each system, each section will hold smaller and smaller plants. And again, I caution, if you do this, don't walk on that soil, it compacts it. You wanna keep that soil nice and loose because of that way, the roots grow down. If you compact the soil, the roots are gonna to try to spread out. They're not gonna go deep. And if your roots go down, you can get more stuff in the space. 
simply because the roots are going deeper and getting their nutri nutrients there. So how do we determine spacing? Regardless of whether you're doing it flat on the ground in a row or you're doing it in a raised bed, you have to space your plants the appropriate distance from each other. So there is, the red arrow shows the spacing between plants. And that's the vertical red arrow. The horizontal red arrow shows your spacing between rows. So if the packet says space your plants two feet apart in rows, three feet apart, that's what that means. You're going to plant in a row two feet apart and rows three feet apart. If you're planting in a raised bed system, you don't worry about the row spacing, but you do, I'm sorry, you don't worry about the spacing between the rows. You use the spacing between the plants in a row. Is that clear? I see some puzzled faces, okay. Whatever you do, don't crowd your plants. Don't think, well, gee, I can get two tomato plants in two by three feet. No, you need air circulation uh, to prevent disease. So at least follow these minimum guidelines for your spacing. So again, I've talked about selecting compact varieties and growing determinate, not indeterminate, and then doing the intensive planting of square foot gardening. Now we're going to get to the fun part, or what I consider the fun part, of vertical gardening. If you can get the plant to grow up a trellis, you have opened up much more space in the ground. And these are, uh, these are slides from Sedgwick County. In the left-hand slide, we have, looks like a hog wire trellis growing those yard long beans. The right-hand side, we've got tomatoes growing in tomato cages. And I'm gonna run through these quickly simply because I think the pictures are great explanations on their own. These are pictures from, again, from Sedgwick County. They have used hog wire or hog panels, which are available at farm supply stores and make excellent sturdy trellises. A narrow bed, they put the bottom of the, of the panels at the edge of the bed, they planted the seeds down the middle and the plants start growing up the trellis. Rebecca McMahon says that by taking these plants up, they have gained 48 square feet of gardening area. The reason that is, if you allow those plants to sprawl all over the yard or your garden, the leaves are covering the ground, shading the ground. They're not going to be opening that ground up for planting something. Send them up, you've got more available ground. It's so another configuration of the hog panels. They set them at the edge of two beds to form an arch or V over the, over the uh, pathway. This is great for things that maybe you wanna reach up and walk under it, reach up and pick. For instance, <coughs> pole beans. This is a really great method for pole beans, uh, cucumbers, uh, lighter weight squash, I would think could be done this way. And then of course, that's what it ends up looking like after it's all planted and growing. I don't think the cute little kid comes with the garden though. <laughs> You'll have to get your own little helper. I have done vertical gardening for 35 years because I want to grow more than my little backyard would handle. So this is a picture of my first, very first vegetable garden. And there are some absolute no-nos in there like don't use railroad ties in your vegetable garden. Uh, the plants will take up the creosote. And if you wonder why I'm strange, it's because I ate creosote. <laughs> I ate creosote tainted vegetables that year. Uh, seriously. Those are PVC pipes. They're uh, three quarter inch diameter. They are set into brackets. And then I strung up all that beautiful nylon netting and my neighbors all were very impressed and thought I knew everything about gardening which I didn't know anything in 1988, but that was the start of my learning. Those trellises got really heavy when I tied my tomatoes to them. And as you can see, they start bending over, but the PVC was flexible, did not break. So that's one idea if you wanna grow up. 
somewhere along the line, we reconfigured our garden. I wanted to make it prettier again. And so we built all these nice pretty boxes and I went to bamboo poles and it's still the nylon netting. Um, if you do, bamboo is fairly inexpensive. It's very sturdy. It can be used over and over if you store it properly during the winter. And it's good for all kinds of crops that you can vine up. Uh, here's a picture of building a teepee with bamboo. You simply set the base of, the, of the, uh, each pole around the perimeter. And this works either in the ground or in a raised bed or even in a container on the deck and then just tie off that top with twine. You can make your own trellis out of twine like they've done here. Uh, twine is much, much less expensive and very sturdy, lasts a season. If it's made out of natural products, then it goes in the compost pile. Okay. Ah, I think a lot of you recognize this one. This is perhaps an overbuilt structure. Um, whether you call it a pergola or a trellis or an archway, this is a wonderful structure for growing all kinds of vegetables. And this was built in 2007. Um, some people know this, not everyone does, but my husband and his brother built this pergola out at the Ag Hall of Fame. And I'm really impressed that it is still standing 15 years later because I like to joke that the trellis on the right hand side my husband also built for me and it fell down four years after being built <laughs> so I say to him why don't you build me something like you did out at the ag hall and I know over the years a lot of different kinds of vining crops have been grown on that pergola at the ag hall the other nice thing about uh, a structure such as one of these is if you're growing a vining plant that produces vegetables, you can also grow flowers up there and make it really pretty. One of my go-to structures for growing up are tomato cages. And we built our own, or we made our own tomato cages out of reinforcing mesh, which is available at most hardware stores. It is pricey, but it's pretty much a one-time investment. Because you make these tomato cages, you cut about a six foot length and you roll it together and you wire it shut. You've got a cylinder and they will last for decades. I leave mine out in the winter because I figure the cold air in the winter will kill whatever virus or bacteria or pathogen may have taken up residence on the cage during the summer. Tomato cages also work well for structural support in containers. Uh, I know a lot of you have seen my uh, blue and black barrels and other presentations I've done. They are approximately 24 inches across and a 24 inch diameter tomato cage fits in there real nicely and will hold cucumbers, hold squash, um, anything you wanna grow in a container. Definitely containers and vertical supports maximize a lot of space in your garden. There's another method that's used for tomatoes called stake and weave. Uh, this photo comes from Rutgers, which is their land grant university that manages agriculture and master gardener stuff. Uh, the link, if you want more information, is there. I know we've done stake and weave at various demonstration gardens around Kansas. You basically set up the posts, you plant your tomatoes between the posts, and as they grow, you are going to weave twine or another support material such as twine back and forth between the posts and around the tomatoes. You have to keep adding that to it as your tomatoes grow taller, but it keeps them nice and upright and leaves room. Now I see this picture is a broad wide open land, but if you did this in a more confined space, you could plant other things in between those rows of tomatoes. Okay, <laughs> yeah, there are limitations on vertical gardening. You want the right plant <laughs> in the right time. Uh, you're not going to try to grow root crops like beets and carrots and onions upwards. That's just not, what, that's just not how they grow. I got to thinking about this and I really wonder, could you grow the sweet potato vine 
up the trellis with the sweet potatoes tubers in a row down below. I've never tried it, um, but now that that thought has crossed my mind, I just might experiment next year and see if it works. Because if you do plant a row and you take those vines up, then you've got all that ground that the vines usually cover available to plant other things. Ideally, it's got to have a vining habit and it's got to be produce of a size and weight that can be supported um, on that trellis. Now, if you absolutely must have a watermelon and you don't know where to put it, they do now make compact watermelon plants that grow those cute little baby, like everybody calls them baby watermelons, but they're full size. That baby watermelon might be able to be supported on a trellis if you give it some kind of support. And many, many years ago, when women still wore pantyhose, old pantyhose that got runs in them were saved for holding up your heavier fruits in the garden. You just drop that developing fruit from the toe of that pantyhose. And then you took the cut off top of the pantyhose and you tied it to the support. And as the fruit grow, grew, the pantyhose expanded. Uh, I used my last set of nylons a couple years ago. That was after 18 years of actually not wearing them anymore. <laughs> So now you go and you look and they make these hammocks and they make net bags. These pictures both came from a well-known online vendor, uh, kind of pricey. The nice thing is if you go to the grocery store and you buy a bag of say apples or onions or oranges, they come in a net bag, save those net bags. So you can use them now to support your fruit as it's growing up the trellis. Containers are an ideal solution to small space gardening. Uh, as you know, we have a couple of classes in the past on container gardening, so I'm not going to get into the details, but you wanna pick the right size container for whatever you're growing. Make sure it has good drainage, use a soilless potting mix, make sure you feed it and watch for pests. This is one of those things where your time, remember we talked about your time and the value of your time in feeding plants. When you garden in containers, they have to be fed more frequently than if they're in the ground and they have to be watered, sometimes twice a day, depending upon the size of the container and how hot and windy it is outside. Okay, this is probably my go-to container. Uh, these are food grade barrels. If you use a barrel, you want to make sure that nothing toxic has ever been stored in it because anything that remains in there could be taken up by the roots of the vegetables and you don't want to get that contamination. I just cut those barrels in half, equal distance from the top to the bottom, flip them over, make sure they have drainage holes in them, fill them with a soilless potting mix and set them wherever you plan to garden. Containers are great because you can follow the sun wherever the sun hits your yard, six, eight hours a day. That's where you want to set your container. Sorry, my mouth is getting dry. Okay, another recent and favorite method of container gardening are the stock tanks that you see on the left hand picture. They are also now producing and selling these steel, corrugated steel frameworks. Uh, they have no bottom in them. This one on the right is four feet by eight feet and comes in this, um, sorry, <laughs> comes in this little box that's maybe two inches thick and four feet long and a foot wide and you put it all together. I know that because I just bought three of them and they are great. Okay, uh, Marty just stepped out of the room. This is what Marty was talking about earlier, obtaining from Turner Community Gardens. Basically, these were designed for gardening for people who maybe did not have as much mobility. Perhaps they were needing to sit down in a walker, a walker seat, or maybe even confined to a wheelchair. They're at the right height for gardening from a seated position. 
And you're not going to grow anything in those that need needs a lot of depth, but they're good for more shallow uh, vegetables. You put that on your deck and um, it's, it's great for tending to. So they're perfect for smaller vegetables, greens, herbs, and edible flowers. This is not a new trend, but it's getting a revival. Uh, Rosalind Creasy was probably the pioneer of foodscaping. So you don't have any room in your garden to put in a 20 by 40 foot garden. And maybe you don't want those barrels sitting around, even if you've dressed them up with a wooden framework. You can plant a lot of your vegetables in with your flowers as long as there's enough sunlight. You're not going to plant a tomato in with your with uh, shade plants, but you can do it with plants or with flowers that love the sun. So Rosalind Creasy was the pioneer. And then last year at the International Master Gardener Conference, there was a young lady from North Carolina named Bree Arthur who presented on the Foodscape Revolution. Both of these books are still in print and still available. And Brie, I think, has taken it maybe even one step further in that she is also growing grains such as wheat or rye or those because you can harvest those heads and use them in your cooking. She grows those instead of ornamental grasses. So her approach goes beyond just planting your vegetables in among your flowers. She actually is using vegetables with beautiful blooms or structural support um, or like the grains in her landscaping. And one thing I've been thinking is, you know, okra, whether you like okra or not, okra is part of the hibiscus family. It's got these beautiful yellow blooms. Why are we planting it in a single file in a vegetable garden when we could plant it in groupings in our in the back border of our flower beds and therefore open up some of that garden space for something else we want to grow. Anyway, both of these books are available uh, for purchase online or gee, are there any bookstores still? In, if there are bookstores still <laughs> in shopping malls, they probably carry them or can get them for you. Okay. So we figured out where and how. We've maximized our needs by priority, monetary value and efficiency. We've determined what layout to use. We're going to utilize vertical growing as much as possible. And we're going to use containers where we can. And maybe we might even get into foodscaping. Okay, so we can stop here, but let's go on. <laughs> we're going to merge those concepts of space and time meaning we're going to plant in the same spot multiple times through the year. Well, don't we do that anyway? Well, maybe. But there are short season vegetables that can come to maturity so quickly that you could actually plant some radishes in April, harvest them and plant some more radishes. Same thing with some of the lettuces. I know a lot of people let their leaf lettuce grow into the clump and then they pull the whole thing out. You can do that, or I just cut off what I need, the rest regrows. Uh, but if you want to try different varieties, pick a short season lettuce, bring it to maturity, harvest it, plant another kind of green in that place. And again, look at those seed packets and determine what is the time to maturity. The shorter the time, the more of those kind of vegetables you can pack into the same space. Then there are your half season vegetables. And this is something I'm really going to have to experiment with because maybe I have been picking the wrong kind of beets um, or carrots because it seems what I'm planting seems to take the whole spring. And I wanna look at shorter season carrots and, and green onions and things of that nature, maybe get a double harvest in. Oops, went wrong. Yeah. Okay, this is probably to me more interesting. Oh, it's Mother's Day weekend. I've got to get my tomatoes and peppers transplanted. No, you don't. If you've got that spot in the ground with 
say you still have some late cabbage coming up and you want to plant tomatoes there, you don't have to start plants at the very beginning of that window that has been determined to be your planting time. And, okay, I'm gonna go to the next one. I hope that's easy to read. In smaller version, it's not really easy to read, but this is in the Kansas Garden Guide. It is also publication MF315, which is best vegetable varieties for Kansas. And it shows you the window you have to plant. So we didn't get home from our travels until the middle of June. And I was able to set out tomatoes. I did not get tomatoes in July like I would have if I'd planted them on Mother's Day. But I did get a halfway decent crop thanks to the heat. Uh, I was still picking tomatoes in October when we finally said to heck with it and pulled them out. Uh, so don't rush to get those warm season vegetables out. Take a look at that window and you can plant them at the, at the end of the growing window. So things that uh, really like heat, I don't start okra or sweet potatoes until Memorial Day weekend. Sometimes I've even been known to do it in early June. They could probably go later. A lot of the vining crops, eggplant, peppers, all of those can be started later in the spring, even though we tend to think we plant them mid-May. So this is just kind of an example of what I plan to try next year. Green spinach lettuce is planted early in April. I may have to provide some frost protection because you know we've been having winter stays around now until June, um, but I do this stuff in containers so I can throw a cover over it pretty easily. I'll add some beets and carrots and green onions later and when it gets removed, warmer, I'll take those out and I'll put in my tomatoes and peppers. I'll harvest those hard early root crops and then uh, like the early root crops being beets and green onions. And then I'll plant potatoes and sweet potatoes. I'm going to grow my okra over in my flower bed. I'm not going to worry about brassicas in the spring. I'm going to wait and I'm going to start them from seed in mid-July, which is what I did this year, inside under lights, and you transplant them out end of August, early September. If it continues to stay hot every year like it is now, I could even bump that transplant further into September. Uh, I could even bump it clear into October, which I have done in the past, and then you have to have your winter protection ready because you will not be harvesting those until December, January. Okay, harvest your potatoes replant those root crops of beets and carrots and onions. Uh, then you're gonna transplant your brassicas. And where did I grow my eggplant? I grew it on the deck. I'm not, a, I don't like eggplant. My husband loves eggplant. So I grow it in a container on the deck where it's very easy for him to take care of it himself. <laughs> that includes cooking it. <laughs> Okay, the problem, the biggest problem you'll probably encounter in gardening in a small space is how do you rotate? Well, when you have big space, you just kind of rotate by family. Oops, did I go too far? Yeah, I did. You rotate by plant families. You're gonna move your vining crops into where the tomatoes were and the tomatoes to where the leaf greens were. And you're just gonna keep that going so that you don't plant the same thing in the same spot more than three years frequency. If you have, like I do now, only three beds, I'm going to end up planting tomatoes in the same place year after year. So if you can't rotate, choose disease resistant varieties that's listed in all that information in the catalog and on seeds packets. Keep a close eye out for disease problems. Your plants are going to let you know if they're sick. You may not be able to say, oh, that's such and such affecting my plant. If you know, great. If you don't, contact the extension office. Our horticultural agent can help you identify the disease. You also want to watch for nutrient deficiencies because if you are doing this intensive gardening, 
that soil is going to be depleted more quickly. Um, also, if you're doing raised beds, the water tends to drain out of them much faster. When the water drains out, it takes the nutrients with it. So you wanna be sure that you are feeding plants as frequently as they need it. I had a neighbor, they grew tomatoes on the west end of their house, four tomato plants every year on the west end of their house. They did that for 30 years in a row. I don't know how they never had disease. I mean, I was just really, I just was in awe. You don't have brown leaves, you don't have wilt, you don't have fungus, you don't have anything. I think they were blessed. Okay. So in other words, your garden can be as simple or as complex as you want it to be. And get to questions. But I want to show you some of the uh, resources that are available. K-State has resource information publications on just about every aspect of gardening now. The Kansas Garden Guide is the Bible for gardening in Kansas. It is free as a download, or you can read it on the computer. as publication S51. And there's the link at the bottom of that slide for the bookstore link. And uh, I see some people in here writing frantically and taking pictures. This slide presentation, every slide in here, I will make available to you. Okay. Additional resources. I thought I owned Mel Bartholomew's square foot gardening book. I went to look for it and I either loaned it to somebody and didn't get it back or I gave it away. But uh, I went to look to see he has a whole entire series now on square foot gardening. And if you're wanting to maximize space, I think that is the best way to go. Then there is high yield gardening, how to get more from your garden space and more from your gardening season. That book is still in print. In fact, if you're here in the room, I have it as one of the books I've brought in. And uh, there are YouTube. We have YouTube uh, videos on container gardening. Gardener Supply is a nursery supply company that offers all kinds of tools and vertical gardening and plant support. I get their catalog. Uh, personally, I think they're pricey. Actually, I'll say I think they're very pricey, but I use their catalog as inspiration. So if I see something in there that I like, I say, hmm, Bob, that's my husband. Bob, can we build this? Mm -hmm. And he'll say, yeah, I suppose we can. <laughs> <laughs> and then we do. The latest thing I've seen in there is if you're plagued with raccoons and squirrels, they now have a big cover for your garden made out of chicken wire and steel frames. You just set that down over the plants that the uh, critters are going after. So if you are plagued with critters and especially Japanese beetles, mm. things that attack, they love the vegetables, they love the green beans, which makes growing pole beans kind of difficult. Take a look at some of those catalogs and see what they are selling to provide an insect barrier. And then perhaps you can construct your own. So that's the point of these two pages of um, slides. And if you want a copy of the slides that contain those information and links, there's my email address. Just ask me. 